Are you all doing all right? Go ahead and have a seat. Well, my name is Gus. I'm the college pastor here at Common Way, and it's, it's good to be with you guys both here and, uh, and, and online. It's just good to be here this morning. I love that last song, Cliff. Nice job, Cliffy. Cliff told me, yeah, big hand for Cliff. Look at him. There he goes. Yeah. Cliff told me this morning, he was like, Gus, you can't preach in those jeans. They're too casual. And I was like, I'll arm wrestle you for it, and I'll let you piece together what happened next, because here I stand. Um, can you next slide me, fellas in the booth? Oh, well, that ain't it. <laughs> hey, 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 there we go. Let's open with a poem this morning. This is one of my very, very favorite poems. It's by Carol Bielek, and it's just, just something to get the juices flowing. I built my house by the sea, not on the sands, mind you, not on the shifting sand, and I built it of rock, a strong house by a strong sea. And we got well acquainted, the sea and I, good neighbors, not that we spoke much, we met in silences, respectful, keeping our distance, but looking our thoughts across the fence of sand, always the fence of sand, our barrier, always the sand between us. And then one day, and I still don't know how it happened, the sea came, without warning, without welcome even, not sudden and swift, but a shifting across the sand like wine, less like the flow of water than the flow of blood, slow but coming, slow but flowing, like an open wound. And I thought of flight, and I thought of drowning, and I thought of death, and while the sea crept higher till it reached my door, and I knew then there was neither flight nor death nor drowning. That when the sea comes calling, you stop being neighbors, well acquainted, friendly at a distant neighbors, and you give your house for a coral castle and you learn to breathe underwater. Just something to percolate on, get the juices flowing. If you're following along this morning in your Bibles, uh, we're going to be flip-flopping between two passages. So if you want to be turning there, we're going to be in Philippians 3 and Romans 7. We're going to go back and forth between those two because they offer us two sides of a coin, uh, kind of, of a picture of the Apostle Paul. You know, we're going to get one side of Paul where he sounds very, very, very kind of confident and up on his high horse a little bit, al almost arrogant, and, and then another picture of Paul that's the complete other side of the coin, other end of the spectrum, where Paul sounds almost dejected and, and kind of laid down low. So pay attention to those two dynamics. We're going to start in Philippians 3, verses 4 through 6. Let's read together. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. This is Paul talking. Circumcised on the eighth day, weird flex from Paul there, uh, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless is what Paul says. Faultless, he says. So Paul here is clearly, you know, fairly confident. He's clearly feeling himself a little bit. He's not shy about, about some of the credentials that he's got attached to his name, or at least he had at one time. Um, and, and really, if you read much of Paul, you can kind of hear this tone in a lot of his writing. Paul is not kind of afraid to, to wield his power a little bit. And what's going on here in the, in the scope of the, the rest of the, pas the passage here is some folks have kind of started to be a little overly confident in themselves, and Paul is, is more or less kind of shutting them down. He kind of hits them with, you know, if anybody here is going to be confident, it's going to be me. So before all you, you know, newbies start acting like you're somebody, let me just tell you my resume. And he goes through this long list. Now, as you might imagine, there's more. To, he doesn't just stop here. There's more to this passage. You know, he adds on to this, and we're going to get to that later. But for a second, let's stop and, and empathize with this moment with Paul. That don't, don't we sometimes have moments where we feel a little bit like this, where we're kind of up on our high horse in some way, where we're, you know, looking around at some of the people around us and thinking like, my goodness, 
I'm, I'm doing all the work, man, I'm, I'm kind of the top dog in this group, or at least in the back of my head, I'm thinking, you know, I'm a little bit better than some of these people around. Maybe you're in a class, and it seems like every group project, you are inevitably the one carrying the weight. Maybe at work, you start to think, nothing would ever get done around here. If it, I mean, I feel that way all the time at my job. I don't know about you guys. You know, you start to think, nothing would get done around here if it weren't for me. I mean, come on, everybody. So, you know, what I'm getting at is, Sometimes I can relate to what Paul is saying here. Now, this same person who has this capacity for confidence and almost a little bit of, you know, bragging um, has a, a totally, you know, other side of the coin in Romans 7, which is where we're going to head next, which is one of my absolute favorite passages. And listen to how different Paul sounds in Romans 7, starting in verse 18. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is this sin that is living in me that does it. So I find this law at work in me. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against me, the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man am I? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? This same person who earlier was riding high, you know, Hebrew of Hebrews, the tribe of Benjamin, all this stuff. He called himself faultless, you know, uh, in the passage we read earlier, is also is saying this, that he feels like he has two versions of himself living inside himself, that, you know, deep down in my inner being, I really do delight in God's law. Really deep down I do, but I, I can't seem to ever get it done. I can't seem to ever make it happen. I feel like I'm a prisoner to this evil that's always at my side. What a wretched man am I. Um, same way as before, sometimes, don't you feel like this? I know I do. Um, sometimes, you know, on, on little stuff, small picture stuff, I'll want to exercise more. And I know in my head that it's good for me. I know that in my head I could go do it. But there's just another side of me that always seems like it wins. You know, every time I want to do something good, there's a, there's a whole other Gus working against me. Or, you know, big stuff. Like, I, I want to be a less angry person. I want to be a kinder person. But for some reason, every time there's an opportunity to do the wrong thing, it seems like I do the wrong thing. Now, it's just worth noting, isn't it interesting, that, that Paul... On one hand, he's got this pride puffing him up at times where he's, you know, Hebrew of Hebrews, he's got this. And then other times he's got this shame just pushing him down. Same guy, and it's written down there in Scripture. I can feel that, I can feel both of those things in a day sometimes. And certainly over the course of my life, um, I can definitely feel those. Now, the things that Paul is grappling with here is, is this, you know, tug of war between pride and pride and shame. And, 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 you know, that's not hard to identify in those passages, you know, but behind both of these things, he's wrestling with something that's, that's a little bit bigger. There's a bigger monster that both his shame and his pride are attached to, and that Paul is dealing with. And that, that bigger, bigger thing, the scarier thing, is his ego. That behind both of those passages, and behind the times in my life when I'm feeling way too puffed up with pride, or I'm feeling way too pushed down with shame, I've mismanaged my ego, or I've, I've lost track of my ego. And that's what we're largely going to be talking about today, is how do I manage my ego? What do I do with my ego? Now, very quickly, what are we talking about when we say ego? I'm not a psychologist. I took Psych 101 in college, but we're not going to get into like id, ego, super ego, and all of that. But broadly, we're just going to say, you know, my ego is, is this sense of self that I have. It's this picture of myself that I've painted of myself. It's my sense of self-importance. Uh, it's, 
It's this version of like, okay, here's what I think Gus ought to be. Now, in a biblical sense, you might think, I can't really think of that many verses that mention ego. You know, we throw that word around a lot, but when do I ever see, I don't have the parable of like the loaf of bread and the ego. But Paul often writes about sins of the flesh or like uh, the, the nature of the flesh and the desire of the flesh. And really that word flesh, you know, it's easy to read that as like, oh, he's talking about my physical body. He's talking about issues of the body. And sometimes he is, but often that word flesh has been misconstrued. And what Paul is really writing about is issues of our arrogant uh, ego, issues of, of our kind of selfish desires. And so when you see Paul writing about the flesh, often he's writing about our ego. Now, the connection between ego and pride, we, we were reading in, in how Paul is, you know, has all these qualifications and all this confidence, that's not a hard path to trace. You know, when my ego gets inflated a little bit, I become a prideful person. You know, heaven help me if I have this perception that, you know, like, I kind of think I'm the smartest person in this room. And then someone asks me for help and I have to help them out. Now this version of myself I had just got validated. And my ego gets built up a little bit and my pride monster starts stomping around looking for people. You turn into like last dance Michael Jordan, just like looking for teammates to punch in the face. And just like an intense ego maniac. So it's not hard to see how ego fuels our pride. We all kind of get that. It might be a little less obvious how ego is actually attached to our shame. And where pride comes from, our ego inflated, our ego kind of volumed up. Shame comes from our ego scorned. It comes from the, from the shadow of my ego. It's the shame is my ego trying to cover something up. You know, if my ego tells me, you know, Gus, you're supposed to be a good guy, you're supposed to be a nice guy, and, and then I do something ugly. You know, I tried to remember back to like, I was a pretty straight-laced kid in elementary school, but the few times that maybe I got sent to the principal's office, you know, I knew I was tr on trouble, in trouble on the outside, but boy, I also felt like I was trouble, in trouble on the inside because I was telling myself, you know, Gus, you're supposed to be a good person. You're supposed to be a nice guy, and you did something ugly. You better cover that up. You better, you better cover up that, that nasty thing that you did and because my ego is telling me to be ashamed of it. Does that sound familiar to anyone else? Is that just me, this idea of you have a version of yourself you think you ought to be, and when you can't hit it, your ego says, don't show anybody that. Cover that up. You ought to be ashamed. So what to do with, with this ego, this sense of self that I've built up, this sense of self-importance. Um, when, when it's going well, it creates pride, and when it's not going well, it, it, it pushes me into shame. It uses shame to motivate me. Well, we're going to look back at Paul's passages, both the ones we looked at before, for the answers, because um, right after the, oh no, we got a little one on the loose. Oh my gosh, has she no shame? <laughs> no, she should not, absolutely. Hey, <laughs> uh, where was I? Tiffany, it is all good. <laughs> no, we're, yeah. uh, Paul's passage, okay, we're gonna look back at Paul's passages. One where he's, he's building up his confidence and the other one where he's saying, like, what a wretched man am I? Right after both those passages, he gives us the answer. And, for example, in the first one where we, we're going to go um, back to Philippians, you know, it'd be easy for us to imagine Paul is going to give us some kind of pastoral answer about what to do with our confidence. You know, use your confidence, use your status for the benefit of other people. I'm going to use my, you know, all this stuff I've been given. The way to manage that is just to kind of make it altruistic. You know, employ your, su your super ego a little bit. Or learn to balance, you know, your pride with a little bit of humility. Learn to work those two together. And that's actually not what Paul does. Paul doesn't point to some spiritual discipline for the answer. Let's read together in verse 7 in chapter 3 of Philippians as to the answer Paul gives us. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more... 
I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. What does Paul immediately point to as the solution to to my inflated ego, to our inflated ego? It's not some disciplined humility. It's not some browbeating thing. It's not him going, you know, yes, I have reasons to confident, but also I've made some mistakes in my life to balance them out. No, because that's still Paul, that's still me looking at myself for the answers. And, you know, I'm still in the end, you know, pointing to me. And Paul says, it's not about pointing to myself less. It's about not pointing to myself at all. It's about pointing to something else. It's that all my qualifications are completely dwarfed by what Jesus has done for me. It's silly to even kind of think of my accomplishments as accomplishments in light of what God has done for me. Likewise, in Romans, where Paul the other side of the coin where Paul has kind of started to really beat himself down. He's, what a wretched man am I and all of that. You know, he says, I don't understand what I, why I do what I do. I don't understand why I am the way I am. Um, you, could, you could imagine what would Paul's answer be to him kind of screaming at himself, to his ego telling him you should be ashamed of yourself. Paul could say, you know, Time for me to turn, you know, a new page over. I'm going to get, you know, an accountability partner. Time for me to join an S group. Time for me to start listening to some podcasts, do some Enneagram work. Time to, you know, pull myself up by my bootstraps. And you could kind of, yeah, okay, let's start working. And again, that's not at all what Paul says. That's not the solution that Paul points to. In Romans 7, verse 25, and then we're going to jump to chapter 8, Paul says, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. In both cases, Paul shows the, the solution to my, to my ego issues, the solution to a healthy self-image is not cultivating some balance between my own pride and my own shame. It's not a self-help tool or even a spiritual discipline. Paul points us back to the cross. The solution is not something that I'm going to do for myself. The solution is something that Jesus has done for me. And when my ego is turning the volume up, On my arrogance, the cross reminds me that I can't do anything to save myself. I'm not the one who did the work. And when my ego has shamed me and is kind of squishing me down low, I can look at the cross and remember the God of the universe is for me and is actually my advocate. Paul writes this this beautiful little phrase. It's just one little verse in Colossians that helps me so much. Colossians 3.3 3 is this small verse, but boy, it packs a punch. Paul writes, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. We're going to look at both of these little sections, starting with the for you died. Now, Paul is not writing about my literal physical you know, bodily death. He's not writing this verse to a group of dead people. But he was, what he is writing about is how when I believe that the creator God of the universe is on my side, and not only on my side, but actually knows me, all my mistakes and my warts and my ugliness, and he actually loves me, and not only that, but he wants a relationship with me and is willing to sacrifice himself to restore that relationship with, with me, when I start to believe that, a part of me starts to die off. There's a part of me that starts to kind of go to sleep, that starts to, that starts to fade away. The part of me that thought I was number one, the part of me that thought I was going to do all the hard work of fixing myself up, that, that I was going to try to be better than everyone else and to prove how important I was. And, and believe it or not, the part of me that was ashamed that I wasn't better 
than everyone else. This self-image that I created and was furiously trying to maintain, my ego starts to quietly disappear. And this thing that I thought was so important, be it my pride or my shame, uh, Jesus starts to strip me of those things. T.S. Eliot has a great, great poem called The Journey of the Magi. Uh, and it's a, it's a poem about one of the three wise men kind of reflecting on his journey years later and reflecting on what he saw that night. Some of you may say, Gus, we're talking about Christmas in August. No big deal. I'm a rebel. I do wild things up here. Uh, one of my favorite poems, and, and it's a, a wise man just reflecting on what he saw that night years and years ago. Eliot writes, all this was a long time ago. I remember, and I would do it again, but set down this, set down this, were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. Imagine being one of these three wise men and coming to this place, the place of Jesus' birth, and kind of realizing, oh, if this is true, if, if, what's hap if what I think is happening is happening, a part of me just went to sleep forever. The part of me that thought I was the number one, the part of me that was so invested in my old kingdoms uh, just died. My, ego, my egocentric self has to die off. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That other expression, the, the hidden with Christ in God is such a comforting one to me. It makes me feel uh, you know, so safe. It, it makes me think of being submerged in water or wrapped in a blanket or, or in a tent or something like that. It's a comforting visual to be, to be wrapped in Christ, in God, to be layered with God. That when I'm feeling so ashamed and my ego is beating me up, I can remember I'm, I'm completely hidden. I'm ensconced in Christ. It's impossible for me to boast. It's impossible for me to to be shameful because I've hidden myself in the death and resurrection of Jesus. I know I've handed over the deed of my life, and I can't brag because I've decided my life is not my own. And likewise, as, as hard as it is to believe, I don't have to be ashamed of myself. I don't have to despair about where my life is heading because God has put his name on me. He has layered me in with him. I'm hidden in him. And me starting to worry about my ego and, and how I'm, you know, making sense of myself and whether I'm living up to this person I thought I was going to be, it starts to not even make sense uh, in light of, of who I'm hidden inside of. Thinking of myself that much would almost be bizarre. To be completely hidden to pride and shame has so little to do with me. Now, you may say, Gus, I... I get what you're saying, I, I feel what you're saying, I vibe with what you're saying, that I gotta let my ego go, I gotta you know, die to myself, I need to get rid of my ego, I wanna be hidden in Christ, how do I actually do that? That's kinda very ethereal, 10,000 feet up in the air. Well, first things first, let God take care of you. Allow yourself to be loved by God. Um, you know, this sounds so easy, and there's a part of myself that I, see, I, I, I can feel my own ego saying, oh my gosh, that can't, all right, I get it, God loves me, that can't actually be the hard work that I have to do. My guess is that for some of you, your ego immediately goes, no, you're not ready for that, you have to clean yourself up before you can enter into that camp. You have to, you have to get your act together, and that is just a lie. Jesus has died for you, he loves you, you're his beloved, you're loved more than you could possibly imagine. Or maybe your ego is saying, it actually can't be that easy, I mean, I'm supposed to do some big stuff, I'm supposed to do important work, it can't be that easy, I'm supposed to be doing more. And it actually is uh, more of a matter of me allowing myself to be loved. Henry Nouwen has a great quote. He says, for most of my life, I've struggled to find God. 
to know God and to love God. I've tried hard to follow the guidelines of the spiritual life, pray always, work for others, read the scriptures, and to avoid many of the temptations to dissipate myself. I have failed many times, but always tried again, even when I was close to despair. Now I wonder whether I have sufficiently realized that during all this time, God has been trying to find me, to know me, and to love me. The question is not, how am I to find God, but how am I to let myself be found by him? The question is not, how am I to know God, but how am I to let myself be known by God? And finally, the question is not, how am I to love God, but how am I to let myself be loved by God? God is looking into the distance for me, trying to find me, and longing to bring me home. Let God take care of you. Allow yourself to be loved by God. Uh, maybe the step that follows naturally after that is allow yourself to be loved by other people. I know for me, uh, I have to almost let my, my guard down to let other people love me. I can feel my ego going like, no, that person probably, either one shaming me and saying, that person probably doesn't actually like you. They probably are just doing that. To, you know, they're trying to be nice to you, but they probably don't actually love you. Or I get prideful and I go, mm, I'm going to keep myself at a distance. I'm going to be a little defensive. I'm going to keep my guard up. I'm not going to let you in quite yet. I think some of the most important work I can do to let go of my ego is actually allow myself to be loved by other people around me. Allow myself to be loved. And what's interesting is the area in my life where I have the least ego is the area where I've let these two things happen. You know, for example, in my marriage with Stephanie, you know, or if you think, you know, in your marriage or, or your relationship with your best friend or parent or sibling, I have almost, I, I got no ego around Stephanie. If I were to try to like brag to Stephanie, like, I don't know if you've heard, but I'm a big deal. It would, it would not go well. It wouldn't even make sense. Like, cause she knows she, there's too much there. It wouldn't even add up. And also if I were to be ashamed around Stephanie to go like, oh, I don't want to tell you something. I'm more, I mean, there's no reason for me to believe that. She loves me so much. How could I be ashamed and how could I be prideful? I don't need an ego. I'm free because she loves me so much. Allow yourself to be loved by other people. And lastly, return the favor. When I, when I let myself be loved by God, when I actually realize I am beloved by God, Jesus died for me, I am loved, it frees me up to love God more than I'm able to do before that. And when I allow myself to be loved by other people, when I realize, wow, these people really actually, I think they're genuine, these are good people. They love me, they actually love me. Why don't I love them back? Why don't I free them from their ego wrestling that they're doing? They're wrestling with pride and shame and all that. Free them up by telling them, hey, I just want you to know I love you. I actually love you just the way you are. Galatians 6, 14. Um, is a helpful wrapping up point. I'm going to read Eugene Peterson's kind of paraphrasing of Galatians 6, 14 through 16. For my, for my part, I'm going to boast about nothing but the cross of our master, Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, I have been crucified in relation to the world, set free from the stifling atmosphere of pleasing others and fitting into the little patterns that they dictate. Can you see the central issue in all of this? It's what God is doing. It's not what, I, what you and I do. It's what God is doing. And he is creating something totally new, a free life. When the sea comes calling, let's give up our houses of pride and shame and trade them for coral castles hidden in the ocean of God's love and learn to breathe underwater. If you would, stand, and we'll pray together before we go. Dear Heavenly Father, um, thank you for your great love and your mercy and your grace. I pray that um, we would allow ourselves to actually be loved by you, to, to have your love um, soak in way deep down in our hearts, and that uh, it would free us from our pride and our shame, and we would start to, to let our ego die away, and we'd be hidden in you. 
pray that that would free us up to be loved by other people. And my goodness, I pray that we'd have the courage to return the favor both, both to you and to the folks around us. We love you, dear God, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us, everybody, both in person and online. Uh, it was great to have you, and we'll see you all next week. I don't trust a fool. I don't trust myself. I don't want to bother you. All of my doubt and regret said I wouldn't bear you. Promise that I'm doing my best, but I think I'm losing my head. Losing my head. Heaven and a China girl. Heaven and an empty dress. Heaven and three wild birds. Heaven and an empty nest. Said I wouldn't miss one. Said I wouldn't buckle under stress, but I think I'm losing my head, I'm losing my head. Oh, Christ, do you wake my gold? Oh, sometimes it seems impossible. Did you keep your body up to forge my trust? Did you keep your body up just to suffer for my savage love?